You're listening to Storytime in Paris on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content and to join our book club, please join us on Patreon. Since well before Victor Hugo looked up at Notre Dame and thought, huh, what if a hunchback lived in there? Authors have been inspired by Paris. Welcome to the Storytime in Paris podcast on Paris Underground Radio, where we keep that tradition alive by showcasing an author with a French connection in each episode. Every episode will feature five questions asked by you, our author's biggest fans, and answered live on air. Then our authors will treat us to a reading of an excerpt from their book. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. Would you like to join the Storytime in Paris book club? Head on over to patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio and stay tuned to the end of this episode for more information. My guest this week is award-winning, number one internationally best-selling author, Ava Stachniak. Ava is known for her lovely, detailed works of historical fiction. And her latest novel, The School of Mirrors, is a wonderfully immersive book spanning the last half of the 18th century. It centers around two women, Veronique, a young girl brought to Versailles to be a courtesan to King Louis XV, and their illegitimate daughter, Marie-Louise. Only, Veronique is told the king is but a mere Polish count, and her daughter is whisked away before ever knowing either parent. The School of Mirrors is a stunning book that nestles its characters in a rich and vivid world, seeped in history. And with that, please allow me to introduce Eva Stachniak, author of The School of Mirrors. Hello, Eva. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hello. Thank you for inviting me, Jennifer. I'm very excited to talk to you about The School of Mirrors, but before we dive in, can you just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Well, I'm a writer. I write historical fiction mostly, and quite a few of my books are actually happening in the 18th century. I came to Canada from Poland in 1981, so a long time ago. I was as a student, a graduate student to McGill University. This was the time of solidarity crisis, so I was lucky to find myself in Canada, and I was able to stay here. I didn't have to return to Poland endure the martial law and all the difficulties of it. Canada is home, has been home for very many years now. I've lived here longer than I ever lived in Poland. I lived in Quebec, in Montreal for about six years, then moved to Ontario. Still love Montreal very, very much. And uh, love writing, love being able to, every new book is like a new life. I can, I, not only I make friends and love <laughs> my new characters, but also I learn about fascinating people I would never have learned about. So writing is my great passion. Fabulous. Can you tell us what your connection to Paris or to France is? Uh, this is an interesting question. I, other than, you know, I, I fell in love with the French language, which I don't speak, unfortunately, very well, but I love it. And, you know, I lived in Montreal, so French was around me for a while. And I think that, Mike, you know, other than this is not the, the only book that was set in Paris or had Parisian characters. My other novels, had I had a French surgeon from Paris, from Napoleonic Paris in my second novel. So there are there were connections always, and of course the French culture always interested me. But with this particular book, Paris appeared just because I came across a, a passage in one of the memoirs that I read that happened to happen in Versailles, and that sort of triggered the whole novel. So that was the connection with this one. But but Paris always interested me, and 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 of course Paris is also connected to Poland very much. It was the seat of the Polish emigration in the 18th and 19th century. So um, if you are Polish, France and Paris are always sort of in your back, in your mind. Have you spent much time in France? Not that much, you know, more like a tourist, you know, so I'll go for two or three weeks. I went on a very extensive, you know, sort of three week research trip for the School of Mirrors. That was quite wonderful. But we spent time, you know, I was, uh, my previous novel about Valerius, about Brania Nizinska, also involved a trip to Monte Carlo, but also to the south of France. And, you know, Nizinska lived in Paris for a while. So I ended up getting to know Paris from the point of view of the ballet russe dancer, you know. So I, it seems to me every time I go to Paris, it's a different Paris, you know, from a different century, different times. But it always is fascinating. I have to tell you, I'm a little surprised. After having read this book, 
I would imagine you to have said that you spent years living in France and years in Versailles, and you spoke the language fluently because your understanding of everything is so profound. Well, thank you. Thank no, you. really, I'm surprised. So can you tell us a little bit about The School of Mirrors? What is this book about? Well, The School of Mirrors, as I said, happened because I came across a little passage in the memoir of Madame Biosset, you know, there's we can argue how authentic these memoirs are, but that's a that's beside this for my purpose. And Madame de Pompadour in this passage is uh, asking Madame Biosset to take care of a pregnant girl, and it's very clear that the girl is pregnant with the king's Louis the Fifteenth child, and that her fate is not going to be very envious because uh, her child will be taken away from her. She'll be married off. And if she has any emotional relationship to the king, which she does, that will be totally disregarded. And and then I learn that Louis the Fifteenth, in order to have these liaisons with these young women and have no consequences of it that he has to deal with, pretends, and then, you know, his disguise is that he presents himself as a Polish count. And I thought, oh my God, you know, here's a Polish connection. And I sort of remember thinking, if you can pretend to be Polish, I can pretend to be French. (laughs) So here we go, one for one. (laughs) So that's how, how it all started. And I knew that the story will have Madame de Pompadour and the king and Madame Diosette in the story, but that the core of the story is that young woman pregnant whose child will be taken away from her. And I wanted it to be the story about the two women, the mother and the daughter. So yes, there's historical background. Yes, there's everything that's happening in France of the Ancien Regime and the French Revolution because, you know, the daughter's life will happen later. But the two women who are fictional characters, but based on a lot of my research into what happened to the girls who were lovers of Louis XV and sort of petite uh, maîtresses. So that's how it all started. Amazing. So I want to talk a little bit more about the research that you did for this book. But this book is, I mean, this spans 40 years and 40 pretty historically important years. It's sort of an epic undertaking. How long did this book take you to write? Um, three years, I would say. The, uh, the the research and the writing and then the, the editing process takes a, about another year. It is free time in many ways because the book lands on your desk and then disappears again for a few months and then comes back. But, uh, you know, I, I'm not a fast writer. I like to immerse myself in the world. I guess that's, uh, you know, there's there are very many fast books that are wonderful reads, but I just don't write that kind of books. They don't interest me that much. I love to have the depth of understanding. And I, I'm very interested in the psychology and in why my characters do things like they do. What is it in them? So that takes time even just to discover them. You know, a lot of my previous books were based on historical characters. And I kind of always knew what they were doing because, the you know, I knew what Brana Nijinska was doing in Paris. I knew that she had two husbands. I mean, there were all sorts of things. With the fictional characters, I had a choice. But that never, you know, that really actually ended up taking me more time. You know, you wouldn't believe how many times I would go for a walk hesitating whom Marie-Louise would marry, because of course she <laughs> could have married anyone. But no, it, I, I tried to get her to marry this guy. And in my mind, it worked to a moment that, oh, no, 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 it's impossible. By that time, I see her, I know her, I know she wouldn't have done it. So a lot of soul searching went into the book and into how the characters developed. That's amazing. This book, I have to tell you, this book is stunning. Thank you. It's beautifully, beautifully written. Thank you. I, I mean, if you were to tell me that you had a time machine and you went back to 18th century France and lived there and saw things and wrote down what you'd seen and felt and experienced, I would absolutely believe you. Well, thank you. But but that sort of reflects my method because I do immerse myself. You know, I, I kind of sit down and I am with Marie-Louise or with Veronique. And I have to, you know, I have to sort of get myself like in a character method, like actors prepare. I have to see myself walk into the room. I have to imagine the room. I may not always describe it, but I have to see it. You know, I, I believe that if I see it, then you will see it. If I don't see it. You won't see it. You're my reader, my ideal reader, the reader who pays attention <laughs> and wants to be with me there. So yes, that. Thank you very much. It kind of 
confirms that what I was trying to do worked. Do you have writing rituals that get you into this place where you can see the things that you're trying to see? Well, lots of little ones. I mean, I I have to be alone. I have to be quiet. I cannot have any, not even music, you know, no noise. Usually just absolute quiet because I have to live in my mind. I start very early in the morning and it's the morning writing. In the evening, I can I can do the imagining, the thinking, the research, but the actual writing has to happen on a fresh, you know, morning. And I also, uh, you know, this is funny. I probably many writers will tell you that when, when you are on the right track, things start happening to you, right? This sort of synchronicity takes over. So I my ritual is to reach for something random in the morning. It could be a book, like one, this particular book that I open it at any place and sort of look at the words, look, just let the subconscious go, let it loose and let it, let myself dream about it. So, so that, that works. And I tend to, it doesn't matter whether, whether it's computer or hand, you know, sort of long hand, it depends on the, the first idea for the scene very often is in longhand, then I transfer it into the computer and go deeper and deeper and deeper. I let myself delete the whole thing and said, oh, that was the wrong. You know, I, I, I never say, OK, I've already put so much work into it. It has to be there because that's very dangerous. So that's another sort of being ruthless with material that may end up being one sentence elsewhere, a perfect sentence you never would have come up with had you not spent you know, a long time sort of writing something that will never make it into the novel. So patience and understanding of the process, trust. <laughs> yeah. You know? And what about the research that you did? Can you talk a little bit about the research that you did? You do a bit in your afterward, but. Oh, yes. I mean, research is, you know, something that's very, very uh, wonderful because it's, uh, I love learning and I love history. And I love learning what I didn't know about, you know, like with the School of Mirrors, I discovered the 18th century midwives. When would I have spent so much time with 18th century midwives? Never. I mean, it was, I never even thought about what midwives really do very much. You know, it's, so that was a big discovery. So what do I do? I, first of all, I read a lot of texts from the time. So memoir, you know, I, my 18th century knowledge is pretty good. I mean, I wrote books about Catherine the Great. I wrote about other 18th century books. So I use that knowledge, but I add on, you know, so reading anything I can find about, you know, memoirs from Versailles memoirs from any anywhere that touches what I'm writing and and then you know when you're reading these things I always lo- look for what caught my attention so maybe a piece of gossip like that somebody stole a gold plate from Versailles from one of the rooms and then if I remember it after reading it then that's a memorable detail I can put it into the book so I make a sort of list of all this so that's one of my part of the research when I finish that research so the reading I love to travel to places that are really important in the novel. So here, of course, Versailles, but not just the palace, which has changed over time, right? And and also, it is pretty easy to describe a sort of glittering salon and and throw in a few. What what I wanted to get was the physical presence there. So how long does it take from Rue de Madrid and Versailles to the stag court? 20 minutes. I I measured it. I went, it, you know. So if so, so that sort of thing. I I have to know how far it was. It's actually, it's actually further from Versailles to Trianon than to where the girls, where the Deer Park girls were kept. You know. So you have that sense of the geography. And and for some reason, when I look at maps and photographs before I go somewhere, it doesn't work for me. I have to be there and get a sense of it. And then, so when I was at Versailles, of course, I, I did the tour of all the important places, but also I would walk and sort of thinking, what would Marie-Louise notice? What would Veronique notice? And that would not necessarily be the obvious things. You know, I remember thinking, going through through the gardens and thinking, oh, if I were Marie-Louise and sort of escaped these horrible guardians of mine, where would I hide? And then I said, oh, there, <laughs> you know, and then I can write it down. What would I see from it? So that was probably how I can get you to sort of imagine with being with me there. The fountains, you know, and, and, and usually, you know, I have probably, the research gives me probably three quarters more than I ever use, but that's okay. That's, you know, you don't put want to cram it with detail. Are you searching for spiritual guidance? The Heart of You podcast is an exploration into your soul through intuition, spirituality, 
Divination and Unconditional Love. Host Annette Lu is a spiritual guidance coach, intuitive, Akashic, and tarot reader who discusses practical ways to integrate spiritual growth into your everyday life. Listen now to The Heart of You on parisundergroundradio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. In Paris, the, the problem with Paris is that, of course, the revolutionary Paris doesn't really exist. I mean, there's no Bastille, there's no Le Temple, there is, uh, the writing school is just a plot, you know. So, so very few places, a conciergerie is there, what, lo- wonderful, so that I could, you know, I, I could actually go and take pictures and imagine myself being in one of these cells. And so that was it. So Paris, I found such marvelous places like the Museum of Police in Paris. And if you've never been there, go because it's a, <laughs> it's a jewel, and it does and gives you a sense of 18th century policing and 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 do, you know the kind of documents people had to carry with them when they if they were stopped by revolutionary guards, and so these wonderful details that a good place can offer. So I do that, and the other thing that you know with the, with the midwives and with, with the moment I discovered how marvelous they were and how I very much want them in the novel. The, the most sort of emotional for me moment of my research was when I took a train from Paris to Rouen to the Museum of the History of Medicine and stood in front of the mannequin, you know, the actual machine. Oh, wow. Tears almost streaming down my eyes because my cheeks, because I thought this piece of equipment, one of the hundreds that, that she had uh, made and used, only one was preserved. And this one saved lives of many children, many women, and changed the life of peasant women who would have had a very ordinary, difficult lives, but they became professional midwives. So moments like that, you know, are quite wonderful. So that's that's my research. I also can recommend if anybody, like the, for me, the French Revolution became a lie when I went to Vizille, to the Museum of French Revolution near Grenoble, because that's where I could, uh, you know, I find a, found a book about posters, for example. And then, you know, because when you're writing, it's hard to, like, okay, so my character's walking through the street. What does she see? And, and I hear that there are always posters. So I want her to come up to a poster and read it and then blank. I don't know what she, I mean, what kind of a poster is it? So in Vizille, I saw a book saying street posters in Paris during the French Revolution. I opened it and here I have a wonderful poster saying, you know, passerby, come here. This is what I want to tell you. You know, the pro- I would never have come up with it. You know, I would never in my wildest imagination have imagined that the poster was it reacting like a passerby, trying to catch your attention, like like a gossip, you know, saying, come here, I have something to tell you. <laughs> so these little details, when you discover them, and when I discover them during my travels or research, I know that they have to go into the novel. Because that's if that struck me so much, it will strike you as a reader and transport you there. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's these little moments, these little details, these little observations that bring everything so much to life in your writing. And my next question was going to be about midwives and the research that you did there, because it was fascinating. I hadn't, I have friends who are midwives, but I'd never thought about where that comes from, that tradition, how it began, and to learn how exalted they actually were at the time because they were saving people's lives. It was fascinating to read about. And especially French, you know, I discovered that the French midwives at that time were the most advanced in the whole of Europe. So that was one thing. And it, again, it, everything came out of this one scene when I saw this this young girl pregnant, you know. And so I wrote the first part of the novel. And then I said, okay, well, she's pregnant and the, the, the child has to be born. I have to tackle this big scene. And said, okay, I need a midwife. <laughs> that was my first thought. And that's where I started searching. And that's why I discovered Madame de Caudrier and found this beautiful biography about her that is actually, you know, I found it online available. It's waiting for wow. me. And reading about who she was. I mean, the life of the actual Madame de Caudrier. Uh, I mean, she appears in the novel. She's not a main character, but her spirit is there. And and also what happens to Marie-Louise and to her aunt sort of mirrors what happened to Madame de Caudrier, who also adopted a young girl who taught her midwifery and changed her life and sort of gave her a new life that was quite quite wonderful. So so that these kind of inspirations, midwives were a big discovery of mine. And 
standing in front of that machine in Rouen was unbelievable, unbelievable moment because it, it's human ingenuity, but it's also her passion. 22 years, she schlepped all over France and there was a little map in, in Rouen with, with showing. It was like a, like a spider's web, you know. She was ever, imagine 18th century travel, terrible roads, right? Carriages. And you have to take, you know, travel with these mannequins, right? You have to have at least two for each town where you or, or village where you gave your course and you taught these intensive courses that sound like contemporary workshops you know hands-on experience talking is fine but these girls have to practice they cannot practice on real women because you know they are not apprentice to a midwife which you know could have worked they have to do it within three months of of taking the course so the machine and so on so that was quite wonderful 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 women it's amazing. Yeah, really fascinating. And I want to talk a little bit about the Deer Park girls as well. From my understanding, there wasn't a lot of actual research. It was mostly just hinted at. Is that true? Well, it is a true story. And the, the, thing, the problem with it is that, of course, very little has been preserved about the girls themselves. You know, so I found... I found quite a few details. And all of the details I found are used in the novel. So the story of the king sort of dropping them and, you know, the girl who discovered who he was and was taken to a mental asylum until she agreed that this was not the king. That is all I found in the diaries. You know, there were lots of people at Versailles who kept diaries. And so I did find that. And also in the period during the French Revolution, of course, when, the, you know, anything royal was considered horrible, there was a lot of effort of, of sort of exposing the crimes of the Ancien Regime, even though you have to take it with a pinch of salt, because I would find reports that there were 100 girls there. I mean, there were not 100 girls. I mean, that that was wishful thinking of someone who wanted to take a little, make a little bit of more money, maybe, with that kind of gossip. But two or three at the time, that was confirmed. So I, I did have some some sources. The rest I had to imagine. I mean, I don't think that there are very, you know, there were one or two names I came across. It was not Veronique. I decided Veronique would be a composite character, but she would be entirely a fictional character. One thing that struck me that in these sources, the girls, it was considered fair that they were paid for what they did. In other words, they got the dowry. And I, at that same time, there were a lot of interviews on the radio with the girls who were victims of Epstein. And, and there was a very similar tendency to sort of say, well, they got the money out of it, right? But when they interviewed the women, they spoke about the emotional pain. And I thought, yes, that's what I was missing. I was missing from these reports that I read. The girls were dismissed, okay. Sure, they were lovers of the king, maybe sometimes for, you know, for one or two nights. And for that, they were well paid and the family was well compensated. There was very little emotional understanding what could it could have meant, especially if the girl was, you know, in love, like the, the one in the story, the girl who had to be taken to an asylum and sort of I. I sort of extrapolated that and gave that episode to Veronique. So they did exist. It was a real uh, house. Uh, it, the Rue de Madrid still exists. There's even the little place. I mean, you can see it marked where the house was. So we know a little bit about it. And these are girls who are 13, 14 years old, who presumably don't have any idea what's going to happen, because I think most women didn't know what was going to happen, even when they were, you know, in the marital bed, as it were. Did you have any reservations or misgivings about the telling of that part of the story of the interaction between the girls and the king? Well, I tried to I tried to make it as true to what I what is important. You know, I wanted the reader to understand that that was a traumatic event on many levels for Veronique. And also, I also want the reader to know that it was considered perfectly normal for men to have young lovers and that the age of consent was 11 at that time. So it was not illegal. I mean, to be true, you know, the church did not condone any sexual relations outside of marriage. So it was a sin, not because it, the, the girls were so young. It was a sin because sex outside marriage was a sin. 
Uh, but the king was the king. He thought that he had a special line to God who was going to forgive him on the, his deathbed, anything, because, you know, King Louis is the relative of God, and therefore nothing will happen to him. So I tried. I tried to make it not too graphic, but, but I had to give a sense of physical violation because uh, without it, that wouldn't be truthful to these to these young women. Now they were, you know, I'm sh- you know some of them finally figured out what was going on, who the who the king was. I mean, who their lover was. But generally, it, there were very many enablers there, right? It, they were kept in the dark on purpose. And in my interpretation, and I, not only mine, because I, I found that suggested in the diaries as well, that the king really wanted that because it gave him more pleasure. You know, he wanted to be loved for himself. He didn't want, you know, he had enough of people loving him because he was the king of France. That was boring. You know, the exciting thing was to be able to sneak out and make himself his own cup of coffee, have an affair with a girl who thinks he was just a Polish count who is uh, the second cousin to the queen and doesn't really live. uh, You know, he just comes visiting to France. So that I really wanted that to be very, very clear and visible. And, And once it was there, you know, I wanted it to be strong enough of an experience to justify what happened to Veronique later on, right? Because it just, these stories didn't always end up well. I mean, you cannot say, oh, she was paid off, she got married, everything was fine. Not necessarily. There was trauma, there was pain, but there was also, you know, the world was not very, very good to women at that time. There were a lot of dangers. And you could, once you slip, you start slipping and, and that becomes very, very, especially if you're not, you don't have anything or anybody around you to protect you. Yeah. So I want to talk about Veronique and Marie-Louise because I, I loved these women, I, these girls, these women, these people that we grow up with or grow up with us, I suppose. If I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Veronique is the only character that's written first person. Yes. Can you talk about why you made that choice? It, it, she sort of decided it, you know, and, <laughs> and it, she started talking to me and that happens all the time. I don't even, you know, I, I accept saying that it may sound funny to anybody who's not a writer, but but characters have to speak and they have a language. Well, she spoke in first person. And and I started writing that voice down and that that came that was the first voice that came. And I started writing it and realized after a while that that voice can carry me far, but it cannot carry the whole novel. And so what was missing? What was missing was the context. You know, this is her voice, but she is among other people. She is there's the mother first, and then there is La Belle, and there is the Madame Bertrand, and there are other Dear Park girls, there's the king. And these people were not speaking to me in their first person voices. And, and, and really, I didn't even want to go there. So I let them be third person characters and, and let Veronique's voice sort of slide through it. So that was the, that was the beginning of the novel. And the novel very often for me comes in layers. So I hear one character and I write that character for as long as I can. And then I, you know, either stop and that voice weaves somewhere in the narrative, I, you know, it returns after some time. So, so I think that that was, again, her choice and perhaps a good choice because if you described, you know, I always, you know, I, when I read about the Epoch Girls, they were never allowed to speak. It was always other people speaking about them and judging them and judging their parents and saying, oh, they, they are fine. They, but they never were allowed to speak themselves. So I, I was quite happy that she was ready to talk to me. And I, and I wrote it all down and kept her voice. I loved that. Yeah. And, and then uh, Marie-Louise? No, she didn't speak in the first person ever. She, she was, I saw her growing up, you know, these first scenes when she's growing up outside of Versailles with the nurse. And the nurse is a good person. The wet nurse is a good person. And it gives her that sort of emotional anchorage that helps her go through the, the, the tough years at Versailles and then sort of links her with midwives. But that, again, uh, happened in third person. I, I trust, you know, by now, I trust these choices. If, if, if a voice comes in the first person, great. But uh, it doesn't always work for the whole novel. And I let her do it. Does French culture sometimes leave you scratching your head? 
Well, you might enjoy listening to our sister podcast, Navigating the French, hosted by journalist Emily Monaco. Each episode focuses on a different word in the French language, and Emily is joined by an expert who will help explore what that word says about French culture. Listen now to Navigating the French on ParisUndergroundRadio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. What struck me about Marie Louise is how she's just like how do how did you get in the mindset of this wonderfully precocious six seven eight year old with all her curiosity and her insolence and and all of that? How do you get into that mindset? I I always reminded myself she is she has to be regal. She has her father is the king of France. He <laughs> not know it for a while. He may not acknowledge it ever. But she has it. And, and you know, I, I'm old enough to see children and know their parents and their grandparents and to see that you inherit a lot without knowing who you inherit it from. So the fact that she never was with her father didn't stop her from having that sense of entitlement, maybe, or maybe not so much that, I mean, the, the sense of wanting to say, I have a voice, I am someone. And, you know, I, I want things. And, and she was like that all the time. But, but I also wanted her to be, to have some of Veronique, which was caring and warm and in a sense, needing, needing love. And she came in layers too. You know, she, she was very clear as a child at first. And then it was not hard to imagine her being taken care of by indifferent servants at Versailles and how it would make her feel. You know, I also profited from research here because I knew what was given to the children because the children were taken care of by the by the palace. Oh, right. So Labelle would have known who she was and would have kept an eye on her. And the children, the the girls were really the ideal career for these girls would be convent. So they really made sure that nuns were around them so that 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 was the Sunday school, the teaching by the nun. But they were never forced, you know, so they didn't want to go into it, into uh, into a convent. They will be provided with some money, or seed money or, or dowry or something like that. So, so I sort of followed that. Okay, so she would have, her first teacher would be a nun and the nun would want her to, you know, which was natural during the education at that time, would like you to be pliant and obedient. And then, of course, Marie-Louise is not. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, uh, I, I really thought about the connection between her and Louis XVI, who was at that point a very, you know, a boy and not, not very much older than her. And also a rebel in some ways. And I, I felt very sorry for him as a character. So I, I just really disliked Louis the Fifteens, even though I hope it doesn't show in the novel because you have to be, you kind of write every character. But but Louis the Sixteenth, I felt so sorry for. He was such an interesting character and so and ended up so badly. But as a boy, he, you know, I read about him, you know, being so interested in building and doing things. And then I started, you know, thinking about him escaping and going to the roof and, you know, and all these things that sort of came about. And they started talking and they, they discovered that they have a lot in common. And that, of course, would be broken up immediately as soon as it would be noticed. So things just developed, you know, by immersing yourself in your character and trying to grow with her, you sort of say, okay. You know, would she be pliant? No. How would she react to the teaching? How would she react to this? Would she, where would she find friends and allies at Versailles? And I kind of, you know, followed it. If I went the wrong way, rode myself into a corner, I would backtrack and go back. And, and it worked in the end. I think, I hope it worked. I think. Yeah, it worked for me. <laughs> Wonderful. Some of the strongest connections that you have in this book are between mothers and daughters, but they're these bonds that kind of exist out of time because these mothers and daughters, we don't see them grow up together. Was that relationship something that you were trying to explore in this novel? Very much so. I I decided at the very beginning, you know, that Veronique will come back to the story because we kind of abandon her at the moment she gives birth, right? We move to Mary Louise. And so, and, and that is one of these long walks and trying to figure out how do I want them to meet? How do they want them to reconnect? How do you reconnect with someone you don't know? 
And that the result came as, in a sense, you know, a lot of what happens to me or happened to me, you know, my mom died of Alzheimer's. And there were moments when she was at the very, so I kind of am very familiar with various stages of the disease. And and when she, there was a stage in which she didn't know who I was entirely. And yet we had a very, very close emotional relationship. And I drew that to that, you know, I, if you know, open the book, you'll see that this is devoted to the memory of my mother. And I think that the relationship with Veronique and her mother were, Veronique has no idea why she loves this young woman, but she loves her. And Veronique sort of trying to navigate it. It all comes out of a lot of my own thoughts and feelings when I was trying to interact with my mom. And I gave her, you know, the moments, you know, there were moments that I remember will never forget when my, you know, I would come and be very sad and my mom would pretend to be a little puppy and, you know, and, and then she was a girl in her mind and I was her best friend and, and she would say, oh, let's go somewhere and play together. So I thought that would work actually between these two women because they have to connect on a different level, just on emotional level. There cannot be a shared childhood, mother, daughter, childhood, right, in life, because that was taken away from them. And in my mother's case, it was taken away by illness. In their case, it was taken away by, by history, by circumstances. But then that last connection came from there. So in a sense, you know, we are all, we are, writers are like that. We just, everything is material, right? Everything, everything you've lived through allows you to maybe some better understanding of the characters. And if I didn't experience it, maybe the book would have developed in a slightly different way. Who knows? Yeah, that's beautiful. There's a real calling from one to another throughout the entire book. Yeah, there's like a, I don't know, like a sonar wave going out from one to the other, looking for the other, then they finally find each other, but in a different way, maybe than either of them imagine. It's really beautiful. Thank you. The characters in this book are going to stay with me for a very long time. What do you do when you finish a book? Do you send the characters off into the world or do you go back and visit with them from time to time? Well, I do send them into the world and keep my fingers crossed and, and you know, like an anxious parent hover over them, you know, whenever I can help the book, you know, or do something to to, to speak about it or promote it. I do it with like an anxious parent. I want them to do well. I want them to be read. <laughs> They're only alive if you read them, right? You know, without a reader, they are just squiggles on the page or printed words. So I, I want them to be read because then they are alive. So I never did really fully abandoned my characters and my previous novels, this novel. But on the other hand, I have... I, I immerse myself in a different story as soon as, as it appears. And then the new story takes over and then there's more and more distance to it. But you never forget them. I think every novel I've ever written, there's, it, it is in my heart, you know, in some way and, and always gives me great pleasure to be able to hear that someone was touched with it or someone read it and liked it. So that's the best thing that can happen to a writer to have the sense that the books are alive. Well, I think now is probably a nice time to hear something from the book. So can you set up the clip that we're going to hear? Is there anything we need to know contextually before we listen to this? The moment I read that fragment about the Deer Park Girl, and that's the first, you know, when I put it down, that's when I heard the voice. And so what you will hear is the very beginning of the novel, the way it came to me. So all you have to know is that this is, what you're hearing is the voice of that girl that will one day be taken to a remote house in Versailles to give birth to a king's daughter without knowing who the father of the child is, most likely. And that is the beginning of the book, too. This is how it appeared. In a, and, and I didn't know where it would take me, but it was very, very strong. And so that's what you'll hear, the voice of a woman called Veronique. Paris, 1755. My mother didn't tell me much. I would have to go into service, she said. It's not what my late father or she had once hoped for me, but it is how it would have to be. I might still do well for myself if I learn fast, that is, and if I learn to please. 
At all times, not only when it suits me, the willful girl that I am, eager to listen to everyone but my own flesh and blood. Should I have guessed what bargain she had struck for me? Perhaps, but I was still a child, even if I had turned thirteen already. I didn't know how to spot danger in the silence between words. I didn't know the sequence of steps in the dance of sacrifice and betrayal. Used women's clothes was my mother's trade. Old taffeta dresses frayed at the hems, underarms rotten with sweat, fancy cord robes once embroidered with silver and gold, now deprived of adornment, the torn muddy skirts of suicides fished out of the river. I hated it when she brought them home to sort and mend, soaked through with the stink of their previous owners, filthy, infested with fleas. We lived on Rue Saint-Honoré by then, on the fifth floor of a building overlooking the Quinzeville market. In our old house on Rue de Jardin, Papa had his own printing shop, where he printed and sold pamphlets and books, and we all lived in an apartment above it. Here, our rented room was divided with strings on which I hung laundry to dry. We slept on folding beds, my brothers on one, Mama and me on another. We ate on Papa's rickety workshop bench, which doubled as a sewing table. We cooked our meals in the communal kitchen downstairs with its smoking fireplace and damp, moldy walls. A place of constant quarrels over firewood and cooking space, and sometimes of blatant thievery. The very day we moved in, I learned its basic rules. Turn your back and your wooden spoon will disappear. Leave your pot unattended and your food will vanish. Marcel was eleven then, Eugene ten, Gaston eight. They no longer attended the parish school, but ran chores for the carpenter or the butcher who had their stalls in the inner yard. Marcel claimed that the carpenter's wife would let him touch her pink tits. Eugene called him a brazen liar. Gaston followed his older brothers in all. They only came home to eat and sleep. Sometimes when I collected their clothes for washing, in their pockets I discovered dice, stones, or dead mice. What would Adele be like had she lived? Children, I often heard Mama say, happen. Then they happen to live or die. God, who has called my sister to his side, is inscrutable. He can take you because he loves you or because he wants to punish you for your sins. Lying in bed beside Mama at night, I thought about Papa and Adele, wondering where they might be. Adele I pictured enveloped in light, joyful in her heavenly bliss, as she worships around the heavenly throne, God's faithful and beloved servant. I imagined Papa there too, although sometimes, remembering that he was not a child and may have sinned, I saw him in purgatory, restless in the eternal queue of souls, awaiting their time of release. On the day my fate had been settled, I was in the kitchen, warming up a pot of bean stew, stirring it all the time to prevent it from burning, while also keeping an eye on my brothers. The fireplace was smoking as badly as ever. Gaston was running in circles, shouting as if possessed by demons, stopping to inhale and starting again, his voice shrill and loud. Here, doggy, here, sit, paw. I'm a hawk. Marcel screamed, throwing himself at his little brother. Get him, get him, Eugene urged him on. I yelled at them to stop and was threatening to whack them with the spoon if they did not obey me when Dame Rambeau's chambermaid, of whom people whispered that she had drowned her passport in the Seine, rushed in. Mamma wanted me upstairs, she said, right now. Is Paris the most romantic city in the world? Host Lily Heisey answers this very question in her podcast, Romancing in Paris, which takes you through the city, arrondissement by arrondissement, by exploring the most romantic and hidden spots Paris has to offer. Listen now to Romancing in Paris on parisundergroundradio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. 
so what's next for you? Are you working on another book at the moment? Oh, I'm working on two projects at the same time, <laughs> not knowing which one will win. So I, it's, it's always at this point, I'm always really terrified to talk about it because, <laughs> because I don't want to jinx any of these ideas. But uh, I might go back to the 18th century. I might go to the beginning of the 20th century, which also tempts me very much. I'm always interested in strong, interesting, fascinating women, uh, women who defy uh, stereotypes or what fate has for them. So that's what's going to be. But uh, I, I'm not... <laughs> Maybe, maybe in a few months, if you if you ask me the same question, I will have an <laughs> answer. But at the moment, I am really hesitant to 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 speak about the new project. So, where can we? Where can people find you? Where can we keep up to date with these projects as they unfold? My website, which I'm sure you'll be able to give in the description of it. So, I keep it pretty much updated. So, anything that there is is there, it will be there. I also am on Facebook and on Instagram and tend to write about things that I uh, related to my writing. So, either the past book or the current book or the present book. So, as soon as there's something is beginning to be strong enough that I feel confident to talk about it, there will be signs of it. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, I'll include links to everything so that people can find you. But thank you, Ava. This was so wonderful. It was really wonderful to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. A pleasure. Thank you again to Ava Stachniak for such an interesting conversation. You can find Ava on Instagram at eStachniak, on Facebook at avastachniak.author, on Twitter at avastachniak, and on her website, avastachniak.com. Please join me next week when I'll be speaking with New York Times and Sunday Times number one bestselling author, Bernadette McDougall, also known as B.A. Paris, about her book, The Prisoner. Check back to see if your questions have been answered and to hear a reading from her book. Thank you for listening to Storytime in Paris. Please remember to rate and review us and also tell a friend. The more people who know about this podcast, the more we'll be able to grow and the more I'll be able to share fabulous books and their authors with you. Join the Storytime Book Club, which welcomes authors who have been featured on the podcast to come talk more in depth about their books. Since we keep the podcast spoiler free, this is the perfect chance to get all your specific questions answered. Please visit patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio for more information. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. You can find me on all socials at Jenny Foria. That's J-E-N-N-Y-P-H-O-R-I-A. Thank you for listening. And until next week, happy reading. This episode of Storytime in Paris was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.